Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tabitha Graves. I'm the Community Enablement Manager for AWS Game Tech. And in this session, we are going to be speaking to the creators of the game AI Dungeon. If you have any questions during the presentation just or just feel like saying hi, uh, please feel free to use the chat feature on the side of the screen. Now, without further ado, the creators of AI Dungeon, the amazing <laughs> Nick and Alan Walton. Hi, Hello. Tabitha. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you guys for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here. Nick and Alan, would you mind telling us what is AI Dungeon all about? Yeah, so AI Dungeon is a AI generated text adventure um, that is completely different from any other game you've played because it it's powered by a super advanced um, natural language machine learning model called GPT-2. Um, and essentially, the way it's different from normal text adventures is in normal text adventures, everything that you do has to be pre-programmed and pre-written. But with AI Dungeon, because the AI can flexibly adapt to whatever action you do and generate story on the fly, you can literally do anything and take the story in directions that we as the developers would never have imagined. Um, and it really opens up some awesome uh, potential and possibilities in terms of how to use AI to enable really cool gaming concepts. That's fantastic. Well, yeah, let's let's actually let's uh, take a step back to where it all began. And let's talk about just how big this accomplishment is, especially to the gaming industry. Yeah, so AI Dungeon initially started as a hackathon project um, about a year ago. Um, where GPT-2 had just come out and I was at a hackathon finishing my last year at college um, and I decided to play around with it. Uh, me and Alan had recently started playing a family D&D group um, and one of the things that I thought was awesome about D&D is because the dungeon master could flexibly adapt to whatever they use, the players wanted to do, um, really anything was possible and so you could come up with all these really fun creative solutions to problems that just wouldn't be available in other games. Um, so playing around with GPT-2 at the hackathon, I realized how good it was at generating stories and kind of had the idea of what if we built kind of a AI dungeon master with, um, with GPT-2 that you could have that same kind of experience. So by the end of the hackathon, I had a fun little prototype um, that worked pretty decently, but um, not as good as the current version because G OpenAI had only released their smallest version of the model. They hadn't released the largest, um, which had the most amazing performance. Um, so over the next several months, I did some more work on it. And when they released the largest version in November of last year, um, that's when it really kicked off. And uh, I was able to finish AI Dungeon 2 um, using the largest version of GP2. And it that was when it was that was when it was just completely different. Um, the, the quality was good enough that you could have these really interesting stories where, for example, in one of my stories, I was a wizard that I searched um, the world for this secret like life magic book and I brought a tree to life. And then the tree was like, had very human emotions about being grateful for being alive and became my best friend. And it was just like so cool to have these magical experiences that no one ever imagined. Um, and, and because of that, when we released it, it exploded um, way bigger than we even expected. And so within a few days, we had hundreds of thousands of people had played AI Dungeon. And so that, that was kind of the explosive start that got the ball rolling. Yeah, I, I know you guys grew to, uh, what, 400K just after three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us some insight into how you did that? Not just, not just uh, how you grew, but like, like how you guys talked to people. Like, how how did that happen? Yeah. So the um, on a technical side, the way we were able to grow that fast without breaking is actually the yeah. game was really just a set of Python scripts and a model that people could play in Google Colab. Um, which is a service that lets people try out machine learning models um, using Google GPUs. And so we just released that code. And so tons of people were able to play that on Google Colab. Um, so that's why 
Even, even then though, even though we weren't paying for GPUs, we were paying for the download cost of the model and that got up to 10 to 20,000 a day because um, we did not expect how high the traffic would be and how much uh, bandwidth that would be. Um, but the awesome thing about this, after three days, we had to cut it off because we just couldn't afford the costs. And within 12 hours, the community had come up with a peer-to-peer -peer, um, torrent downloading system so that they could still play the game. And some of them were seeding terabytes of bandwidth for a dungeon. Um, so that was one. That was one moment when we realized that it wasn't just a cool game, but there were a ton of people that were passionate about it, and there was an awesome community forming around AI Dungeon. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, no, tell me about the collaboration between the two of you, because I know, uh, you know, starting with the Hackathon project and in uh, finishing school and, you know, for it becoming so popular so quickly, how did you guys move to, to finish the different iterations of AI Dungeon? So to start with, uh, Nick was really the mastermind behind the original version. And when it started exploding, he came to me and um, invited me to come and get involved. So I spent 10 years in tech in various roles, and uh, we just started building it from a side project into a full game and into a company. Um, so uh, AWS was a huge part of that. Uh, we deliberately chose to build on top of scalable services so that whenever our usage spiked, we could uh, spike the number of servers that we were running to support it as well. And um, we also deliberately built on things that were already well developed and had good user interfaces so that we didn't have to spend a lot of time figuring out all of the little details and instead could focus on the game and on the user base. Awesome. Well, um, let's take a second. Uh, I know you guys grew over to 400K. Where are you guys at right now for, for the amount of players? So um, when we were when we first made these slides, it was 400K. Um, yeah. The first time we practiced yeah. it, it was 800K. And now we've doubled again yeah. to about 1.6 million. So 4X okay. since that initial. That's an, an unbelievable achievement, and, and congrats to you guys. Let's transition and take a sneak peek into how AI Dungeon is played. All right. Okay, so one of the great things about AI Dungeon is it's storytelling. And storytelling is one of the most human things. And storytelling is best when it's shared. So as we go through this, um, I'm not going to make all the choices. Uh, sh feel free to, to suggest what you think we should do as well. So I'll start us off, though. Let's, let's do a fantasy scenario. Okay, what kind of character do we want to be? Um, I always uh, go with wizard. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Tabitha. No, yeah, is there like a monk or are there choices on the yeah, screen? Yeah, there's choices on the screen. So there's noble, knight, squire, wizard, ranger, peasant, and rogue. Let's, let's do a wizard. Okay. What's your favorite wizard name, Tabitha? Oh, oh, uh, Sir Barrington. All right. <laughs> She was ready for that one. <laughs> yep. I was I was not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's call us Sir Barrington. You are Sir Barrington, a wizard living in the kingdom of Larian. You have a staff and a spellbook. You finish your long journey and finally arrive at the ruin you've been looking for. You look around and see that it's indeed a ruined city, but not one you've ever seen before. What will you do? Ooh, can I investigate? Yep, you can do anything. This is truly unlimited. So you want to investigate the ruins? Uh, I want to investigate the ruins, but can I run around uh -huh. first? Well, I, I'll stop asking you, can I? You absolutely can. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to run around a ruin, and then I want to investigate. Okay. And investigate. You run around the ruins and investigate them. You decide to go back to the city center and check out what's going on there. What next? What? What, what's going on there? <laughs> well, let's continue and have it narrate some more. Okay. The city is now under control by a group called the Order of the Shadow. Ooh. They're very organized, and they seem to be making good progress against the gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> So, Poor gnomes. Um, to illustrate some of the elements here, uh, 
I couldn't tell if I didn't already know where the human written prompt left off and the AI picked up. And that is something that just hasn't happened before. This is the first time that the AI has been that seamless where it can continue a story that someone else has started, right? And then you'll also notice that it starts introducing elements that weren't even there in the prompt. This order of the shadow and the gnomes are things that it learned from its training data, but um, it pulled in on its own and now gives us an opportunity to play with. So I think, are, yeah, I think the ahead. other cool thing is um, this is completely different than, and I've played probably a hundred wizard scenarios with that exact same start. And I've never found an order of the shadow in the city and I've never mm -hmm. found gnomes in the city, ruined city. And so it's, it's so cool that every adventure is completely unique and you can have such a different experience yeah. each time. Yep. Well, I think, you know, maybe it comes down to running around first before you investigate. <laughs> That's right. That's what uh, I was missing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then maybe you'll you'll find uh, the Order of the Shadows. No, I think this is I think this is amazing. And this is, you know, as far as having a, a dungeon master, you know, having artificial intelligence in the place of a dungeon master, it's something that uh, I've never seen, obviously, and I think that this is something, it's very exciting where this can go, um, especially for, uh, as we're going to dive in and look into um, the future of game development, like how it, it's it's the two of you who started this, um, and it's really exciting seeing how this just rapidly grew into something that, you know, obviously you guys couldn't even predict. Absolutely. Let's dive into the architecture. I think we've gotten a good taste. Great. So for uh, gearing up, I know you guys not not just use AWS services, but you guys have used a whole um, from the beginning part of developing. You guys have used a whole uh, group of open sourced services as well, um, especially for not just the web portion, but for your uh, mobile app as well. Yeah. So um, this just like all software, um, you can't accomplish anything without standing on the shoulders of giants. So um, we've had some great services that have helped make all of this work that we've been able to put together. Um, so the, the ones we can see here, uh, a really core one is React and React Native. So that's our, our visual language uh, for both iOS, Android, and web. Um, React Native Web is not as commonly used, but because AI Dungeon is a text adventure, um, it's relatively simple, and so it's able to work well with this emerging technology. So the great thing about React Native is it lets you have a common code base across multiple platforms without sacrificing the power and freedom of those native platforms themselves. So the React Native elements can connect in to the, the native libraries and functions themselves and can let you have the full power of that phone or tablet available when you can use it while still coding in a common JavaScript sort of syntax. Um, on top of that, React Native um, lets us has a, has a library called Code Push, which allows us to push out updates to users' phones without having them requiring them to go and reinstall or to update their app from the App Store. So that lets us have a pace of iterative improvement that's far beyond what you can do with one-week turnaround releases with App Store cycles. Um, instead, we're releasing multiple times per day and just constantly improving the game. Um, so React Native has been very helpful there. Um, Aurora is um, helpful as a scalable database solution. So uh, we try to build our entire system to be stateless so that any request coming from any user's device can hit any server and can uh, be serviced without needing ad additional contextual information. But to do that, you do have to have that state somewhere. You have to have somewhere to have your persistent data. And that's where Aurora fits in. So all of our users, all of our stories, um, we, we store them in Aurora so that we can get access to them from anywhere. Um, Elastic Beanstalk is the piece that connects those two. So we have a, a Node.js API that runs on top of Beanstalk servers. Uh, we actually have 12 servers running at any time, and they're all just micros. Um, it's, it's actually really light in terms of server workload for just processing requests, but having 
multiple servers lets us do easy rolling deploys so that we can upgrade without any downtime. And it also means that when we have those spikes of usage, and in the early days sometimes we'd see our usage spike 10 times over the course of a single day, um, we can quickly spin up additional servers and be able to handle that usage as it comes without spending a ton in unused um, server time. So that, that's been really great. Um, of course, OpenAI is the, the technology that um, really enabled this and made it all possible. So OpenAI is a machine learning um, research and sort of think tank organization. And so they've been doing lots of work around natural language processing. And as Nick said, published their models and just made them available for people to use. So um, as far as we're aware, this may be the largest application of OpenAI AI's models that has ever been deployed, which is really exciting. Uh, yeah, and, yep. and Go ahead. Uh, just to add on to that, um, they've been really supportive too. A lot of the people at OpenAI have been really excited about AI Dungeon and the use cases, and so they've been they've been really awesome at supporting this kind of um, application of their work too. Absolutely. So um, deploying these machine learning models is actually quite a challenging technical problem. Uh, the model that we're using is about five gigabytes. And to run that model, you need to have enough memory on your graphics card to make an entire copy of the model as well as having the model itself. So you need over 10 gigabytes of graphics card memory. And if you look at like home PCs or Xboxes and PS4s, um, the only devices that have that much memory are the GTX 1080 Ti and 2080 Ti graphics cards. So about 2% of desktop users have a graphics card that's powerful enough to run this game, which is insane because this is a text adventure <laughs> and it has some of the <laughs> highest minimum specs of any game on the market today. Um, so that's why uh, we've really turned to the web for running those um, those graphics cards instead. So we have a cluster of um, dozens to hundreds of servers with really strong GPUs. Currently, we're using 16 gig um, GPU servers on AWS. And we have um, sometimes hundreds of those running simultaneously, just letting users play the game. So uh, to pull that off, we have to have really good orchestration of those servers. So that's where um, the Elastic Kubernetes service comes in. That's sort of the underlying layer that allows us to manage a large set of servers and to route um, requests to each of them individually. Um, and then Cortex is an open source product um, that lets us quickly spin up that at whatever scale we need to. So um, we were able to get to, uh, we peaked at over 700 servers and we were able to go from zero to 700 in less than three weeks because Cortex was able to handle so much of that heavy lifting for us. Um, and they've been really helpful as well. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on calls with the Cortex core team um, just as we stress test their software as well as our own. So um, that's sort of the core infrastructure that uh, has made all of this possible in terms of delivery. And then in addition, um, we've seen people playing the model or playing the game um, have uh, used another set of services. So um, as we sort of uh, demonstrated here, uh, AI Dungeon is really fun to play with other people. And so Twitch is a really interesting place to watch people play because you have a Twitch uh, personality, a streamer, who's playing it live with their audience. And the audience gives suggestions about what they think should happen next. And so the result of that sort of collaborative storytelling, along with the humor and the quirkiness of the AI and the humor and personality of the streamer, makes a really fun experience. And so we've seen a ton of our growth come from that cycle where people will go watch one of their streamers, uh, Twitch streamers or YouTubers playing the game, and then we'll go and try it out for themselves. So. Um, those platforms are, are really effective for spreading this type of, of game experience to more people. And then Alexa, of course, um, to cover the last one, uh, this is a really interesting game for voice, a voice interface because the entire game is text. And so um, from the very beginning, we've had a community of visually impaired players who love this game because they get 
as good of an experience as all of the other players do. And um, Alexa sort of illustrates that as well. So we were actually able to build a version of this that worked on Alexa in one day. Um, but we did run into challenges um, with the Alexa interface at the time. It, I, it might have gotten better. But at the time, there was a 16-second timeout on user action. Um, it thought that the user must have walked away or done something else if it didn't hear from them. And with AI Dungeon, it sometimes takes 30 seconds for you to just stop laughing before you're ready to do what you want to do next. And it might take a minute or two to decide. So um, we haven't made it work for that platform yet. For the moment, we're focusing on sort of our core React Native apps. But we're excited to come back to the voice assistants um, as we get the, the team and the bandwidth to do so. So that's a quick overview of the of the systems that we're building on top of that make all of this possible. Awesome. And before we actually, I know that before we dive into uh, the actual reference architecture of uh, how everything is set up and the different services that come together for this, um, would you mind going back to the AI model? Because I know that is is used to power your game would you mind um maybe walking through the particular or the specific open ai uh model that you guys you guys utilize today yeah um i can walk through that so gpt2 is you can kind of think of it as a super advanced text predictor so it takes in text that's already there and tries to predict what's the most likely next word um the difference with this and a text predictor on your phone is this uses massive compute and has massive training on a huge amount of the internet, so roughly 50 gigabytes of internet text it's been trained on, and so it knows about so many different things. It knows about news articles gnomes. and niche, <laughs> niche games and gnomes and um, yes. storytelling <laughs> and just all these different things. And so then we take that and we can leverage that knowledge it already knows, and we can also um, train it additionally on uh, text adventures so that it understands kind of the format of a text adventure and maybe what kind of language and what kind of things might happen. Um, so then we, we have this super advanced AI model that can just continue writing a story. So you feed it some story and it just predicts, okay, what's a good next word and one after that. And by piecing those words together, you end up with compelling stories. Um, so, and then we just, we just combine that with user collaboration, right? So the user enters an action and so it continues generating a story based on that action. Um, so that's kind of the, the rough outline of how GPT-2 works. Um, and I think one of the really cool things about it is you, because it learns from unstructured text data, you don't need training data to teach it things. You don't need label training data is what I should say to teach it things. So you can just go scrape 50 gigabytes of text data of which on the internet, there's almost endless text, there, text data. There's more text data than you could ever hope to train on realistically. Um, and you can learn all these things about how the world works from that, right? So you can learn that if you jump off, off a large height, you might fall and break a leg. Or if you, um, ask someone for a quest, they might tell you this. So you learn kind of this model of how the world works without having to do any labeling. And so that I think that's the really powerful part of um, GPT-2 is you can learn all that stuff without having to generate massive amounts of labeled data. And then you can use that to generate a story and to have a game engine that decides what happens next. It provides a human element to it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so before we actually dive into the the back end, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Alan, like what what made you go with the decision to choose serverless? I know, you know, part of the services that you're utilizing uh, is Aurora, you know, uh, EKS, um, Elastic Beanstalk. Um, I'm really, I'm curious what, what fueled that decision. Yeah, so we're not doing serverless, but we are doing stateless. Oh. Yeah. Stateless, uh -huh. sorry. So the, the difference there is stateless means each of your servers knows everything that it needs for any user. So when we have 200,000 um, users in a week, it for many systems, you would have to keep track of which user has been talking to which server and make sure that every time that user has a request, it goes to the same place 
because um, that's the place where it has the rest of its data. So it's sort of like the difference between having a personal chauffeur and calling up an Uber driver. Um, it's much easier when any of your drivers can carry any of your passengers. And in this case, that means that um, when we need to scale, we can quickly double the number of servers and half of the users will start going to the new servers and there aren't any problems because any server can handle any user. And in fact, um, especially with the GPU servers where we're having uh, usually only five to 10 simultaneous users per server, each individual request that you make, each time you make an action, it will often go to a completely different server. So um, that just, uh, it simplifies the uh, architecture, it simplifies the infrastructure, it simplifies scaling, and just makes it much, much easier to make these systems actually work. And uh, in fact, most of the bugs that we've seen have been in the few cases where we haven't stuck to that stateless model. So for example, in the app, it will try to remember some things about you instead of asking back to the API and the database every time. And it's those cases where it tries to remember where it most often gets it wrong. So we're actually moving even more into uh, a fully um, stateless app, as well as the stateless um, API and GPU servers that we're currently doing. That's really interesting. Let's actually, so let, uh, would you mind walking us through the uh, actual environment and how it's architected with uh, the reference architecture? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, as you have a new request come in from iOS, Android, or the web. Um, that hits our uh, backend API, just like most uh, products would. Um, we have had to look at uh, scaling beyond what most uh, organizations have ever done. So um, we've heard that this is one of the, the largest um, implementations of a machine learning model this large that anyone has, has ever tried to do. And as a result of that, we've had to have some extra layers to handle scaling when we need it. So one of those is Amazon Route 53. So Route 53 lets you do uh, latency-based routing across multiple AWS regions. So that means if, you, if your app is either has latency demands where you really need fast response times, or just you need redundancy across multiple uh, regions, or if you just need scale, if you need uh, enough server capacity across multiple regions, you can route whatever users are closest to a given region to that region without doing anything more than just updating the DNS settings. So um, the DNS look is the lookup for, in our case, the, the api.aidungeon.io, and the Route 53 latency routing will let it let that um, URL resolve to a specific server that could be anywhere in the world. So that gives us um, the ability to 10x our entire stack if we, as we need to, to handle um, high volume of users. So um, from there, uh, those requests would go to a load balancer for Elastic Beanstalk. So the load balancer sits in front of our currently a dozen um, Beanstalk servers that actually manage the API requests and just routes those requests to one of those servers. So that gives um, another level of, sort of scalability in between the users and the servers. Um, the servers themselves are relatively simple. Um, so for Beanstalk, you uh, upload the code that the server should run and then set up the server to uh, download the code itself each time that it needs to spin up a new instance. So uh, we have um, dynamic auto-scaling on this Beanstalk uh, implementation so that if we're getting a, a rush of users um, right now, we can actually have the system itself decide, okay, I need to go get two or four or 10 more servers to handle this load. And that will just happen automatically as it's watching its own usage so that it can um, adapt to changes without needing us to give attention and time to that. So that's ve that's been very effective as well. Um, so the, the API servers can't operate on, a, on their own though. There's only so many things you can do with the stateless server. And so for the things that are hard, we reach out to Aurora and Kubernetes. So as I mentioned before, Aurora is the persistence layer 
And um, beyond just a, a simple database on RDS or a self-hosted database, Aurora lets you scale horizontally just like Beanstalk does. So we've had times where um, our database would start getting hit uh, harder than we expected because either we had a mistake in our code, most often like a missing index, or we had a spike in users, often from a, a new Twitch streamer or YouTuber uh, putting a video out. Um, and so when those things happened, uh, we were able to go into Aurora and say, okay, right now I want two more read replicas so that I can handle this load. And having that ability to scale horizontally bought us the time that we needed to go and track down the actual problem or for the initial spike at the launch of a video to pass um, and get back to a normal workload. So that scalability has been really critical. Um, on the other side, we've got Kubernetes, which has sort of the similar scalability um, attributes, where um, our Kubernetes cluster is connected to an AWS EC2 autoscaling group. And the autoscaling group, just like the Beanstalk um, side of things, lets you set up criteria uh, by which it can decide to add more servers. So in our case, um, this was one of the areas that was hardest as we were dealing with the growth because most of the functionality around autoscaling for the past 10 years has been designed based off of servers that have primarily CPU workloads. So CPU workloads are how most games are built, how most web apps are built. But for this particular game, the GPU workload from the machine learning model um, is much, much larger than all of the CPU workload combined. So to, to put this in perspective, um, the amount of computing power required for one user to play the game is more computing power than is required on the CPU for all of the users that we've ever had playing the game at the same time. So <laughs> it's just a completely different order of magnitude. Um, so because of that, these autoscaling groups being designed for CPUs didn't scale very well for our GPU cluster. Uh, it was like, it's sort of like trying to hold up a stick, like a four foot stick from one end at arm's length. Um, it's very hard because you're holding a very small piece and there's um, a much larger piece that you're trying to steady based off of that small piece. Um, it takes a lot of muscle power to do that. And in this case, it's the, it's the noise and the variability. So uh, as you have requests coming in, those requests will have random fluctuations. Sometimes some extra people will come, sometimes there'll be fewer. And that means the autoscaling system has to be careful not to um, over adapt to those random noise. But when you're, when you're basing that auto-scaling off of your CPU utilization, which is the, the default um, factor, uh, then uh, for these GPU clusters, the CPU utilization moves more randomly than it does based off of users because it's the, the graphics card that's doing all the work. So um, we, we found it was very challenging to make that happen. So the way we finally got it all to work is actually by building a custom auto-scaling system using the, the auto-scaling group, um, simple rules, and CloudWatch. So the great thing about that is CloudWatch can hook into any of the metrics that you're using across any of your AWS services. So in our case, we were actually able to have CloudWatch pay attention not to the Kubernetes service at all, but instead to the Beanstalk service and watch the latency, how long it took for requests on average to make it through the, the Beanstalk servers. And that latency was actually a much better predictor of the actual workload of the system than the CPU on the um, Kubernetes servers was at all. Um, and so that, that was very helpful, was having access to those root building blocks that let us build a custom solution to do the auto scaling that we needed to adapt to constantly changing user loads. So I think that's the, the core pieces in terms of this reference architecture, though happy to go into more details um, as they're interesting. Yeah, um, I really, I wanna go back to the scaling part of it because obviously there's so many pieces of this that contribute to that. Um, as your game is growing, like why is, why is that important having having your architecture set up like the way it is right now. Yeah. So uh, games grow um, organically. They grow exponentially, um, especially if they're growing by word of mouth. 
uh, if each person shares the game with two other people, then that's a doubling of the number of users on your game. So you have to have infrastructure that can double with you. And there are really only two ways to scale your infrastructure. One is you can try and get bigger and bigger servers. So, and this is what many companies do, is they, when their server can no longer handle the, handle the load, they change it, they upgrade it for a bigger and better server that can now handle the load. And that works, but only up to a point. At some point, you run out of opportunities to upgrade. You're already using the biggest server out there, um, and it just doesn't work anymore. Um, but the other option is horizontal scaling where instead of going and getting a server that's twice as powerful, you go and get a second server. Um, but that introduces a different set of problems, such as um, managing which users are going to which servers. So um, the combination of the horizontal scaling, along with um, things like the load balancing, the stateless um, servers, and the, the latency routing, let us split our traffic and um, just seamlessly have the workload be handled by whatever server has the bandwidth to handle it. Um, so the, the core thing is the horizontal scaling um, both is better in the long term because it can handle workloads that you'll hit if you hit a really successful game, but it also um, changes how you think about your system in a way that simplifies it and makes it more resilient to failure at any point. Because if you have one powerful server, if you need to upgrade that server, then you have to bring the system down. And most games do this. Most games have scheduled maintenance, often every week, where they have to bring the system down and no one can play. But when you have horizontal scaling, you can bring down half of the system and leave the other half up with no problem. And you can uh, operate a game without ever having to kick your users off and make people stop playing. So that's been really valuable as we've grown, being able to adapt to the changes and to continue to improve the product without ever having to kick the people off and uh, prevent them from playing. How many, how many users are you able to support with your uh, current architecture? Yeah, so um, we try to keep uh, a 10x factor in reserve in the architecture at any time. Um, but if we needed to, uh, we've mapped it out where we could scale using this architecture up to um, the equivalent of the number one game on Steam. So um, that would be roughly a million simultaneous players. Um, this architecture would be enough to handle a million simultaneous players. Well, I know <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, did you want to cover uh, before we jump into community? Did you want to, you know, cover anything else with your architecture? Yeah. So um, just a, a couple of things that were sort of gotchas that um, could be useful to other people trying to build systems like this. Um, so we talked about the auto scaling uh, set of problems. Um, that one was really important. Um, another one was um, the choice of the database technology that you're using. So we found that this actually made a big difference. Our original technology was a MySQL instance on Amazon Aurora. And um, that is really easy, especially for people that are used to JavaScript to do, because MySQL has a lot of features that are very nice for JavaScript developers. Um, it lets you keep your variable names the same as the names of the columns in the database, for example. Um, but it also has limitations when it comes to performance and scaling. So as we grew, we hit a point where making a small change to our system, like adding a new column to the database, required us to bring down the entire system for 15 minutes to try and get the change to run, and then it still wouldn't run. It just didn't have the, the resiliency to be changed while you're using it. Um, and so we, we ended up having to do a, having to rip out that entire database and transition it over to a Postgres database instead. Uh, so that was also able to run on Amazon Aurora, but um, Postgres just was fundamentally more resilient and stable for what we needed to do than MySQL was. And on top of that, 
um, we actually have a Postgres extension called Timescale DB that has been really critical for um, several of our data sets that are really high volume and are sort of event driven. Um, and that's a really common thing for game companies to need because to understand your users, you need to pay attention to what they're doing. And what they're doing is often a very high, high throughput sequence of events. So Timescale DB lets you store your event data as not just a single table, which can easily get unruly, but as a series of hyper tables where you can have a table for every day and as far as your, you, you can see, as far as using it, it looks like one table, but under the scenes, it's a whole series of tables. And let's, that lets them have really, really good performance when you're looking at your event data. Because if you want to see just the stuff for today, then you'd only have to query that table and you don't have to cycle through all of the other events that you've ever had from the beginning of time. Um, so that combined with some, some really interesting features around uh, compression, um, we found that we were able to compress our data sets by about 80% um, using the compression technology in TimescaleDB. And then we also, um, that compression actually improved our query performance so that we were able to get even more mileage out of the same uh, power of server by compressing that event data. Um, and that's, that's sort of similar in terms of uh, mindset as the serverless workload that we're doing um, because you're trying to make it so that each piece of information only has to be touched once and doesn't you don't have to go back to it again and again. So this event data, um, we make it immutable so that we're never updating it. We just, uh, whenever there's a change, we just log the new change and that lets us compress it in a way that gives us these really good returns because you don't have to unzip the file essentially to go and change values in it. So that's one that's been very interesting is the, the timescale DB on Postgres on top of Aurora. Um, and then the other thing that I think is worth mentioning here that really makes what we've done different than how most people approach things is just speed of iteration. So, um, I've, I've worked at a series of companies, and my, my first technology job, um, we had a waterfall development process. So we actually had 18-month release cycles. Um, we had an entire division with hundreds of testers, and it might be two years before your code was actually being used by a customer. And you might not, not even be at the company by then, you, and you definitely have been working on something else by then. Um, my next place was a a um, more standard sort of agile B2B company. And um, in that context, we were doing a release every month and we'd spend a week every month doing testing. And we had a team of dozens of manual testers that we worked with. And then your code would get out to customers in about a month and you could see them using it and figure out what, what you needed to do better. Um, but what we've been doing here is actually one step beyond that, where instead of doing releases every month, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing multiple releases per person per day. So we've actually done across um, web, iOS, Android, the API, and the machine learning model, we've done over 1,800 pushes to production, releases to customers this year. Um, and that just allows a closeness with your customers that you cannot get if you have longer release cycles. So that's possible because of the React Native code push, because of the horizontal scaling that we're doing across the system. Um, and that means that we can talk to our customers. We've got a Discord server where that our, our users actually built for us and invited us to come join them. Um, but we've got a Discord server, we've got uh, Twitter, we've got Instagram, we've got App Store reviews. We can have a customer alert us to a problem or an opportunity and within five to 15 minutes sometimes, we can release something that fixes that problem or fulf fulfills that opportunity. And so that, that closeness with customers, I think is really one of the, the most powerful things that has happened as we've built this project. That's amazing and uh, an incredible uh, sequitur into, into our next topic of community. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, also I love the fact that that your community that you built rallied together uh, and and basically built a larger community through like Discord and and through different different uh, uh, various ways of of talking to each other. And we will have uh, on the side 
We'll have links um, in our, and I'll, I'll t address this later, but we'll have links on the side that everyone can access uh, to your Discord channel or your Instagram um, if you want to build that community as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so thank you. And I know community has played such an important role, you know, for uh, AI Dungeon and, and for you guys. So let's talk about what's next for you guys in games. Um, so how do you imagine this type of achievement, what you guys have created with AI Dungeon, how will that impact uh, future game developers in our industry for, for game development? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that I think using this kind of AI in games can really transform in a very powerful way. Um, so some of the issues with current games are and, and these are largely technical to no fault of the, of the developers of those games, is often you want to create this like vast interactive world that's immersive and you feel like you have all these different interesting stories. Um, and there's some fundamental limits you come across. If you do it through traditional procedural generation, up to a point, it start, at a point, it starts feeling like every city you've generated is the same as the previous city. Um, every NPC is basically the same as the previous. So, for example, you can see that in Skyrim to a degree with like guards. Um, you talk to one guard in one town and he says the same things as a guard in another town. And, and eventually that breaks the immersion when they all like say the same comments and have the same life story. Um, the other issue is you can handcraft all this stuff, right? Like you can write a different life story for everyone, but that's just so expensive in terms of developer time um that eventually you just there's a there's a limit of what you can do with there as well and the third issue is the ability to to change dynamically based on what the user does right so if you want to have interesting stories and write them and craft them you really need to set limited options that the player can choose from so often in dialogue or choice trees you only have a few options and that's all you can do. You can't think of other interesting creative options um, because you just can't write results for all of those. And that's that's another issue where often the player feels constrained. Like, oh, I don't want to do either of those options. Those are both kind of dumb. You know, what can I do? I can't do anything instead. Whereas what AI could enable is you could imagine a vast world. And, and we're not quite there yet with AI Dungeon, but this is our long-term vision is you could imagine a vast world that is powered by AI where the different NPCs are each have their own generated life story and are doing actions generated by the AI based on you know their circumstances and their surroundings and you could even have NPCs that are doing things doing interesting things while the player is off doing something else so like you could imagine going on some quest to defeat an ogre and coming back and finding that the mayor of the little village that you're from has decided to become a necromancer just of his own volition and turned everyone into undead, right? And so you can imagine this kind of dynamically changing game world. And if you have persistence in that, that becomes really powerful because then not only are interesting dynamic things happening, but you could also have the player be able to make any choice they want and have that affect the world long term. And I think that's another thing players really hungry for is they're the hero of this story and they do these amazing things and then no one cares or the world's not actually different because of it. And there's kind of a break and immersion from that as well. And so I think there's a lot of power for all for AI to transform all these aspects of games and kind of create the immersive dynamic and persistent worlds that a lot of people have dreamed about, but just haven't been technically possible before. Yeah, it sounds like it, this is twofold, right? So it is it is creating, you know, these different experiences, not just for players, but it is also taking a lot of the lift off for developers um, to dive a little deeper into creating, you know, those type of immersive experiences for players. So yeah. it, it's it that's really neat. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of our our goal is our goal is not to replace game developers. It's to create right. these tools that make it so you don't need a 200 person team and five years to make an amazing expansive world maybe you only need five people in a year 
that can create kind of the the overarching structure of the, wh what the world and the game is like and let the AI fill in all the details and create this dynamic living world around the overarching structure that um, they have made. Yeah, I really like that vision, that vision for the future. And, and this this type of tool that you're creating, I can definitely see how, you know, it can be used in in uh, in for the future of game development. Um, so, you know, talking about you guys, any insight into the future of AI Dungeon? Yeah, so we've got um, some really exciting things that were just released and more planned. So just a week ago, we released our premium subscription, which includes multiplayer play, mm. so that you can play uh, with people anywhere around the world, and nice. also audio narration through Amazon Polly, so you can have a a narrator read your unique story that no one else has ever had to you as you play. So um, those were released just a week ago and we've gotten some really good um, user responses there. Um, our next sort of big milestones that we're looking at are around giving users more tools to create interesting experiences. So another thing that we've done recently is we've actually rebuilt our entire core game using the same tools that we make available for all of our users so that um, anyone in our community can now create games like the original one that we made. And um, in expanding that, one of the really exciting things that we're working on right now is the ability to do quests as part of your experience. So right now, the, the game is very open-ended. It's sort of like Minecraft creative mode. You can do anything, but at the same time, you have no fixed direction where you need to go. And there are some people that really enjoy that, but a lot of people enjoy a sense of progression and an objective that they can work towards. So um, we've been working hard using um, data that our community has built, has given us to create a quest completion detection engine that will let you set a goal for your story and then work towards it and then know when you've completed it. It seems like a small thing, but with these AI models, um, this has actually been really challenging and we're really excited to get it out and actually have players using it. So those are things coming soon. That's awesome. No, I'm really excited about that. And I know we probably already addressed this, you know, during this session, um, but would you mind just for clarity telling everybody uh, how they can get the chance to play the different uh, ways of playing uh, AI Dungeon? Yeah, so AI Dungeon is completely free to play. We want to keep it as free for as many people uh, as we can, as long as possible. Um, and so you can find it on at, on the web at play.aidungeon.io, or you can find it in the Android and iOS stores. Um, it's just called the AI Dungeon app, um, AI Dungeon. So uh, feel free to check it out. Um, and then if you wanna support the project, we've got our premium subscription in app, and then we've got a, a Patreon community that's been very supportive. So feel free to join and uh, join us as we move towards this future of gaming. We're excited to, to push it there. Well, that's about it. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we are definitely looking forward uh, to seeing everything that you guys have coming out uh, from AI Dungeon this year and, and between you and your team. Nick and Alan, uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, everyone else, thank you so much for, for tuning in. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we have uh, on the side uh, our resource center, which different links that we've talked about throughout the session, uh, all those links will, will live there with more details on, on AI Dungeon. Um, also, we have, uh, please feel free to explore other sessions that are happening uh, during the online event. And if you have any additional tech questions, um, you can stop by, we have a section called Ask the Experts. Um, where you can ask uh, different questions uh, that have popped up about any of the services that we've talked about during this session. Uh, again, Nick and Alan, thank you so much. Thank you, Tabitha. It was great. Yeah.